Welcome to our webinar on the top five Wi-Fi mistakes by industrial engineers. This is Oliver Wang with Moxa, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. If you have any questions at any time during the session, use the questions pane on your screen to submit your question. There will be a live Q&A session after this presentation to address as many questions as we can. We have a big turnout today, and I'd like to give a shout out to those who are attending from Latin America. Although we are broadcasting in English, we'll be happy to take your questions in Spanish or Portuguese, and we'll send you a private follow-up after the webinar. At this time, let me take a moment to introduce our presenter, Nick Sandoval. Nick has over 10 years of experience supporting engineering requirements for industrial automation. He is also a Cisco Certified Network Associate and Certified Linux Professional, and has lent his technical expertise towards successful networking deployments for Boeing, Caltrans, Honeywell, Chevron, and Tesla Motor. Nick, hand it over to you. Thanks, Oliver. I appreciate it. All right, so let's get started. Um, top five Wi-Fi mistakes by industrial engineers. So let's get started with a poll question. Number one. Are we running here? Okay, a little, a little laggy there. So what is the, the primary reason you choose wireless over wired communication for a given project or assignment? So we have a couple choices there, right? Wireless is cheaper, uh, gets devices online faster. Sometimes uh, devices aren't fixed, right? They could be stationed, they could be uh, moving and whatnot. Uh, wired connections may just not be an option for, for the site configuration. Or And if you put another, please uh, elaborate in the question field so that way we could uh, see, uh, get more information from your systems here. All right, a lot of use because of, because objects are moving around and not stationary. That's awesome, okay. We'll give I'll you guys a few more seconds to vote. Let's uh, hear from everyone. And don't forget to use that questions pane uh, if you do have something that's not on this list. Nick, are you ready to call it? I think so. So number one reason is that you can see right there. Uh, your devices may be mobile, right? So they're, mob they're mobile, they're moving around. Uh, wires are just not gonna work in that case. Uh, Number two reason, wireless gets your devices on, online quick, uh, quickly. I, honestly, that surprises me a little bit. I, I, thought, I thought wireless uh, is cheaper would actually be uh, the, the number two reason, but I see that's actually trailing to uh, policy number four, so hmm, very good information here. Thank you, guys. All right, so let's get started with the fun stuff, right? Mistake number one, understanding how different wireless communication is. Okay, so a lot of us, make assumptions based off previous experience. Wired networks are pretty easy to configure usually once once we you know um, how networks work and whatnot. You plug in the cable, there are some configurations that may be involved, but, it, but it's very different than the wireless space. And sometimes we take those assumptions to the wireless space. And so that's the first thing you gotta remember is when do you gotta use wireless? When is that gonna be the most applicable? And I'll say the top three reasons we found is mobile applications, so that was in line with your questions. Um, you have an application that's that's moving. I mean, imagine a bus with a cable dragging behind it. Not gonna work, right? Uh, installation cost savings is a big one, usually. It, it actually, tra that's why it surprised me a little bit. It trailed a little bit on the questions there, but um, usually from c talking to customers, that's a big reason why they often choose wireless. They, they wanna save on, on cost, uh, usually with uh, the, the deployment. Uh, think of the cost involved in, in laying new cable and, and uh, reconnecting everything, and worst case, you may have to even trench, uh, which is extremely expensive if you have to do that. So. Wired networks can be a lot more expensive than wireless networks uh, when you look at the total cost of actually deploying it. And the third reason is flexible design. Uh, you need you need to be able to move things around. You need to be able to add devices and things like that easily. Uh, now imagine your wireless phone, for example, when you went uh, when you got your new device and you went home with it, you probably put on your wireless wireless network as as opposed to use your shadow plan, and that was an easy th thing to do, right? Even your, your laptop, you just do a quick search on the SSID, uh, scan, find what, what the SSIDs are available, choose your network, put in your, your password, and you're running your set. So that's the beauty of wireless. So when you think of wireless, remember, it, it's all about radio waves. The higher the frequency, the lower 
the penetrating power is one, one of the attributes with that, but you're going to get more bandwidth. Now the opposite is also true. Lower the frequency, you get lower, you get lower bandwidth, but more penetrating power. So let's see how that really plays out. So I have a diagram here of uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. It looks like uh, the screen's a little laggy here. I have a diagram that should uh, pop up soon, hopefully. Let's see, we are running. Okay, so sorry about that, a little delay here. Um, so it, what's special about Fort Collins, Colorado is this. If you've ever gone to a store, let's say a, a big box store like Best Mart, those type of stores, you may see clocks, um, let's say atomic clock on them. There's even watches. I actually have a Casio watch that says an, an atomic clock. When, when it says that, it's not saying that it's actually an atomic clock. What's actually saying is that it synchronizes to an atomic clock. So this atomic clock uh, is actually a low bandwidth signal, Re extremely low. Think, think of this, you only, you only um, the only thing you're passing is just the time synchronizing data, right? Nothing more. So it's extremely low bandwidth, but that very low, band, uh, low frequency signal is strong enough to propagate all the U.S. as well as you, you can see in that diagram, and that's on a good day, you could go even to parts of Africa, which is quite incredible if you think about it. Um, now, to give you, I don't know if you guys know how California is sort of structured, but we have uh, several, um, several valleys of mountains, several alleys of mountains, should I say, go between us and uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. So that signal is so strong that it could propagate through those mountains and still be able to synchronize our clocks here, which is quite impressive. So when you think of lower frequencies, think that you're going to get better penetrating power, but you're going to have less bandwidth in general. Now, 2.4 and 5 are the two traditional frequencies when it comes to, to Wi-Fi. Uh, now, the 900 megahertz is sort of new to, to Wi-Fi. There's no standard ratified yet. Uh, one reason why I have it there is there's several vendors, including ourselves, that, that have 900 megahertz solutions with Wi-Fi technology. So it works the same as Wi-Fi where you put uh, clients and APs and things like that. But the challenge here is interoperability because there's no standard built behind it. There's no guarantee that uh, other vendors are going to work uh, even though they may have similar technologies. But it's low bandwidth as well. The major asset of this of this frequency is the, the ability to penetrate. Uh, you know, line of sight is no, not a requirement using 900 megahertz. Uh, it could slice through walls and, and, and trees and things like that without, without much issue. So that's one of the major be benefits. As you go to 2.4, so higher frequency, so it's going to be less penetrating power than 900 megahertz, but you're going to find that it has more bandwidth in general. 900 megahertz to get 54 megs out of it, it takes up the entire 900 megahertz pipe. On 2.4, there are three non-overlapping channels, 1, 6, and 11. Again, I'll say it, 1, 6, and 11. So those are the channels you normally want to stay on. If you're in Europe, you have channel 13. Uh, for, for those uh, that might be international. So, but that only gives us three channels, usually, to, to play with. So that's not a lot. And 2.4 has been around for a while, so there's a lot of devices on it. So that does also its benefit because it has backwards compatibility. So the backwards compatibility is a benefit. Highly congested is a detriment. Five gigahertz, on the other hand, is going to have the benefit of having less congestion. It's not going to have the backwards compatibility that 2.4 does. Uh, there's not as many devices even today. Some new devices don't support 5 gigahertz, um, especially lower cost solutions. So often they only support 2.4. So keep that in mind uh, when you lay out your network. Uh, if you want to go with 5, make sure the, that every device on your network, even if it's newer, uh, is, is supporting that frequency. But you're going to find that every channel is non-overlapping. So you have a lot more channels to play with, especially if you have DFS, and I'll speak to that later. And having less devices on it is going to, and having a lot more channels to play with means there's going to be a lot less uh, congestion. But 
it is going to be the frequency that has a lot less penetrating power. I'll give you a quick example of that. We actually had a, a, a customer, they were deploying buses, and they wanted to put the antennas outside the bus because um, they wanted to make sure they weren't going to get uh, any any liability concerns uh, from like leaks or whatnot, if, excuse me, if they had to make a, a hole inside the bus. So they, they decided to do five gigahertz uh, originally because of the less congestion and whatnot. When they actually tested though, they, their, their performance wasn't up to par. So then they tested 2.4 and they also tested a uh, signal outside the bus, so they, they have a basic comparison. With 2.4, there was no attenuation whatsoever. With 5 gigahertz, they were losing about half the signal. So 2.4 was pretty much giving them the same uh, frequency, the same signal strength, I say, as outside the bus, which was pretty good for them. So the lower frequency, the better penetrating power. But you can have some issues. So with that, let's jump into poll question number two. So what is the level of experience with deploying wireless networks? All right, we have some uh, feedback coming in. All right, we see some uh, good responses, and some one of the responses no one uh, no one's choosing so far. We'll give you a little bit more time to see uh, what is the level of experience of people on this call on this webinar. All right, we'll go ahead and close it, and let's take a look at the results. Oh, great. So, wow, 9% of you guys are, are, are pretty knowledgeable, right? You don't need to uh, rely on, on either uh, Google or, or Wikipedia or whatnot to, to find out what the WPA2 is, MIMO, and uh, DFS. That's great. Uh, and the majority of you guys out there have done uh, some numerous wireless deployments, so that's very good. Very good turnout here. All right, so let's get started. Number two mistake, neglecting to collect site data. That's a mistake I see a lot do. And let's, let's uh, speak to that a little bit more. So site survey, this is a wireless site survey. These are, are, are the steps you would do to do a full site survey. Now, the question I get asked, do I always need to do a site survey? Uh, my answer to that, you know, it's going to be the consultant answer. It depends, right? It's going to depend on how mission critical the deployment is and how big the system is. The more, if either one of those two, the more you really, doing something like this is really advantageous. So when you do a site survey, the first thing you can do is you want to understand the requirements. Where, what are the, the system have to, the form and metric for that system? Um, what are the bandwidth requirements? Uh, is there any roaming requirements for that system if you have something with mobility? Uh, how mission critical is it, things like that. And then the next thing is figuring out how things are laid out, figuring out a diagram of, of, of the system, uh, where, where are going to be obstructions, things like that. Um, now, just working off the diagrams never a good idea. You'll, you'll want to go on the site uh, definitely and inspect. And you can be looking for a couple things. You can be looking for, with, for inference sources. The best way to do that is with spectrum analyzers if you have such. Um, you can be looking for attenuation barriers. Uh, a couple things to note is that that uh, glass, for example, is an attenuation barrier, to, to, especially at five gigahertz. Sometimes uh, we think, oh, because we could see right through it, 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 it could, it's not going to affect the Wi-Fi wireless signal. And it does. Uh, not a not to a big regard unless it's a really thick piece, but things to consider. So once you do the inspection, you actually figure out the, how things are laid out, then you could figure out your coverage area, and then finally, you, where we're going to lay out the AP. So let's go into a little bit more details. Uh, first, uh, some using tools really, really helps. Now, there's actually a free tool available for anyone that wants to use it um, at iwcalculator.moxa.com. IW actually stands for industrial wireless, so that's what it stands for. So, so industrial wireless calculator.moxa.com essentially. Uh, but iwcalculator.moxa.com. And this tool uh, allows you to use drop downs to choose which client and which access point you can be using, what's the antenna type you can be using, what's the frequency, um, things like that. And we're actually 
going into new revision, we're going to be adding more more tools to this this software tool, which is going to be even more advantageous. But it's a great start, especially because it's freely available. But when you really want to go out there and do something more more elaborate, using doing a heat map is usually the way to go. This is going to give you your your uh, ability to to see the the coverage area you have on your system. And this is two very different examples um, of doing that. So there's two ways of doing this, mainly software and physical. The software tools available, there are two major uh, softwares out there. Not to say these are the only two or the ones that we recommend, but these are definitely the two out, the biggest ones. Uh, Air Magnet and Ikahau are the two big heavyweights in the space. Uh, the other method is doing it physically. So from in our in the commercial space, uh, software is usually uh, uh, the only method that, that could often I shouldn't say usually, um, but it, it could often be the only method um, that's utilized. But in the industrial space, I actually don't see it used as, as often uh, as you would in the commercial. Uh, I see it this way, and, and not necessarily where someone on a segue, but you actually physically go out there. Now, if you have a if you're on a, have a segue to do this, that's a bonus, right? I love when I saw that picture. It's like, oh, that's something different. But usually, you're going to be going actually out there. And you're going to be using the same, the the right equipment or the same equipment you can be deploying. Um, it's the best way to to build these heat maps. And usually, how it works is uh, you're going to have to put the access point powered somehow. Sometimes with a battery, um, you power it where you think it's going to somewhat where you think it's going to be placed, and then you grab a client and you take measurements in different locations and chart out you know, what's the signal strength at, at all these locations. And then you move the access point again, and, and, and you, you repeat. Um, that's doing it through physically and creating this heat map, which really is a great tool because you can find out, okay, where's my coverage areas, where's my, my lapses, so maybe you need another access point there, or you, or you move the existing access, or, or where you move where you're going to, where you can install your access point, you just move that location over. So once you finally choose your locations, then you want to make sure you put you put the right product in the right price. Uh, there's outdoor units, there's indoor units, there's units in all kinds of environments. If it's air conditioned, uh, in a cozy environment, then you're going to choose a commercial grade product. If it's going to be a little bit more more uh, hardened, then you can choose more a more hardened product, right, for that application. So with that, we're going to go with mistake number three, assuming more is better. Now more sometimes means more money, something that costs more is better, and that's not always the case. Uh, which we'll talk about. And usually where I see this be a big issue is with signal. Uh, assuming more signal is always better, and that's not actually the case. I've seen this plenty of times where you could oversaturate your signal. Um, I see negative, uh, above negative 30, now remember these are negatives, so negative 20 will be stronger than negative 30. If you get negative 20, that's definitely extremely hot. Now, every vendor might be a little different with this, so keep that in mind, but uh, with our gear, this is about what I see. So negative 20 or on is going to be really strong. And ours aside, for those that don't know, it is, um, is, a, is an indicator of signal strength. So. A negative 30 RSSI is really strong. If, if you get negative 40s to negative 65, I'll say that's that's about right. And again, this, there might be some flavors for different vendors, might be a little different, but that's usually the case. Uh, negative 95 means you have no signal, um, for those that, that know. So negative 95 to negative 65 would be, well, I'll say negative 65 to negative, um, so negative 75 is, is good. But not great, but as you start going below there, the you know, signal starts getting weaker, you're going to get less bandwidth and things like that. So you don't want too strong of a signal too, though. So I see this too often. So often I see it because there's the wrong antenna selection. Usually antennas with more gain cost more money. So we think, oh, they got to be better solutions. Not always the case, and I'll speak to that. First, it's worth knowing that there's two types of antennas. Omni and directional. So omni essentially means that uh, the antenna is going to radiate equally in all directions. Directional, you're, you're focusing your reception one direction. Now, when you think of antennas, there's actually a, a term in economics known as tin staffle, and this is really applicable here, I think. Uh, it stands for there's no such thing as a free lunch. Essentially what it means is uh, there's always a trade-off. There's always a cost. So when you go with a high-gain antenna, 
not, how is it pulling the, the additional signal being a passive device? It's doing something to that signal to get more gain out of it. That, so there's a cost involved. So if you look at the low gain, you see that's very spherical in nature. Versus a high gain antenna, it starts getting flatter like a donut. Now, a, a good way to picture this is uh, think of a balloon. You had a balloon you were holding in your hand. Um, as you increase the gain, you're squishing the balloon more and more, so your, your two fingers are going, getting closer to each other. Um, as you squish it more and more until it almost becomes a donut, where your fingers almost touch each other, that balloon spreads out, right? But you're sacrificing the top and bottom. You're, you're sacrificing your vertical component uh, with high-gain antennas. That's something that a lot of customers don't realize. So I've seen this plenty of times where you may mount it really high, uh, ha have the antenna, uh, an omnidirectional pointed perfectly uh, vertical. Um, you're far away, you get excellent coverage. As you get really close and near, near the antenna, there's almost no coverage at all. Uh, it could be two things in that case, right, oversaturation. Um, but most likely, if you're using a high-gain antenna and you're, you're below the antenna and you have no signal, it's because of this element right here. You're, 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 you have a high-gain antenna and you sacrifice a vertical component. And if you're really close to it, near the bottom or the top of it, there's no coverage. Um, the way to resolve that is, is two ways. One, either change antenna, which is pretty obvious, right? Go with a lower gain. Um, the second way is down tilt. So you grab the antenna and you tilt it downwards a little bit. So it's not perfectly vertical. It's actually uh, uh, pointing a little bit more towards the, the bottom. Um, and that usually gives you um, your coverage in, on, in that area. Now, when you think of a high gain antenna, High gain directional antennas, excuse me. So directional means you're actually blasting in one specific direction. I mean, sort of, you know, 360, even though you're sacrificing the vertical, uh, it's still 360 horizontal coverage. Directional, you're grabbing both the horizontal and vertical and blasting a, a, a specific direction. So you can see this example is a pretty high gain antenna. Um, it actually looks really neat, I think. But you can see that uh, there, there's a lot of horizontal and vertical coverage that gets lost, but you get a lot more signal out of it. You go, go much farther. So what's important with directional antennas, uh, especially when it, as the, high, the gain gets really high, is, is uh, lining them up and making sure they're pointing towards each other. So really high gain directional antennas don't work well with mobility applications for this reason. Usually it's going to be more for fixed locations. Uh, lower gain directional, maybe. So with that, let's go on further. So let's jump into the poll question number three. When purchasing a Wi-Fi connectivity product, what's the biggest factor in your decision? And this is a good one here. Is it, com is it competitively priced? Is price a big thing for you guys? Or, or do you see brand reputation as being one? Um, do you look at the technical specs? Do the support 802.11a, b, g, n, that type of stuff? Um, how easy it is to deploy? Or are you looking at more of the real world performance and whatnot? So for those of you who uh, might be confused, just uh, you can interact directly with the presentation screen to place your vote. You don't actually have to send uh, questions on the questions tab to let us know what you're voting for in this case. It was only if uh, there was an other option. But I uh, appreciate all of your, your feedback and your interaction with the poll. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at those results. Give you a few more seconds. All right, Nick, take a look. Awesome. So real world hardware wireless performance, definitely the leading thing in LC number two is technical specs. This is good information. Um, three is almost a toss up, but I'll say ease of working with, with the hardware is number three and brand reputation number four. And price is, is, is the last one. That surprises me a little bit, but it's good information. Thank you everyone for, uh, for filling out the poll here. So. Let's talk about this mistake that, that I do see customers make. May not be so applicable to everyone in the audience though, which could be good, but it's worth talking. So adapting equipment beyond its intended purpose, and I, I've seen this so many times. Um, so there's commercial, right? Uh, there's commercial grade, and commercial grade is great for its intended purpose, so what it's designed for, right? Uh, it's designed to meet uh, IT needs. It's designed to make sure to withstand office space environment and its demands. Um, and it can offer a great initial cost when you look at, at uh, industrial. Now, think of another analogy before I go to industrial. Think of Soho, sm small 
oh, uh, so sorry, uh, Soho stands for uh, small office, home office. So small uh, home office, the type of uh, applications are like your D-Links, your Link says that you find in Best Buy, that's a Soho solution. We wouldn't call that commercial grade usually. Uh, commercial would be like enterprise level stuff. Um, you want to normally use, like would you have your house in your office space? Probably not going to work very well, unless your office is really small, it, it may. But it's not going to give you the uptime and things like that that you need for commercial space. The same thing applies for, for industrial. You're not going to use what you find in, in, in commercial space that has a different target audience and put it in industrial. Industrial is built a little different, um, regardless which vendor you go with. An industrial manufacturer is, is going to look at, at what its target audience is, and usually the target audience is engineers. So it's built with engineers in mind. It's going to make sure it's easy to deploy for engineers and has is feature rich, and the features are specifically targeted for the industrial space. And I'll talk about some uh, some features that I think uh, will we'll clear this up. Other things, uh, they're normally going to be more tested and vetted. Uh, for example, this is something that, that Moxa does, is we test that everything uh, in an oven, fully loaded, uh, 20 to 40 hours, no batch testing. So every single product, leaving our factory, is put in this process, in this vetting process, to make sure that uh, there's no premature failures and no, no infant mortality. So these are things that are sort of requirements for industrial space, because you need uptime is a lot more important than, than the commercial. If you lose your email for a few seconds, does that really matter? Not really, right? Um, you're not going to be calling your IT team because you lost your email for, for a few seconds. But uh, if something that's a little bit more mission critical, whether it's a fact, there's some, uh, many other applications out there, um, if you lose your data for, for, for that amount of time, it can be a, a real real issue. And safety systems uh, are part of, of this network sometimes, and it could definitely be a serious issue. So, so you need that uptime. So it's built. So the equipment's also built very different. From the ground up, it's designed for these harsh environments. Usually, you're going to be using a fanless design. Um, there might be no vent holes uh, to, to take out dust, especially for if it's built for dusty environments. Um, you can see the technology is designed specifically for the space. And this is the plug for for our company here. Uh, NASA actually tells, tested a. Uh, tested and approved us and and deployed uh, one of our access points in the space station. Um, they, they, they looked at, at both commercial and industrial, and they chose the industrial space because that's, that's going give to give them the type of uh, uptime they need. Uh, other things you can see in industrial space common, commonly is uh, high MTBFs, uh, mean time between failures. That, that is an indicator of how, how long the equipment's going to last, usually. So industrial space, usually you're not replacing the equipment very often. You want to make sure it's, it's, it's going to be on the field, it's going to work consistently for a very long time before you have to go there and maintain it. So that's speaking. That's showing uh, some of our events right there, just to give you that that visibility. So one thing that a lot of people don't don't look at when you when you think of temperature, a lot of, almost everybody thinks of high temperature, but the low temperature often gets uh, ignored. I'll say. So for those in cold cold environments, uh, maybe not the case, but it's definitely very applicable though. Now think of I like giving this analogy. Uh, think of a car in, in a really cold environment. For, I'm in Southern California here, so I, I don't experience this very often, but uh, I'm sure some of you may have, where if it gets really, really cold one day and you try to start your car, it, it might be hard to crank up, right? It may take some time until it finally starts. Now, electronics don't have internal combustion engines, but it's a very similar process. Uh, it could be really hard to get the device to boot. Once it boots, um, usually you'll be okay for, for uh, a while unless it, the temperature d dips a little lower and then if it, dips, if it dips too low there might be a point where it's just never going to boot. Um, but usually the internal heat, uh, if, if, it's, if it's not too cold, it keeps it running. Now, going too hot is a different story. That's when your devices start crashing and whatnot and it's just not going to work in a high temperature environment if it's not built for it correctly. So with that, another thing you have to be really careful with is when you, when you choose your, your, your given vendor, that, that it's going to be interoperable with uh, other players, right? So you want to make sure it's Wi-Fi certified. Um, so when you have this Wi-Fi certification, essentially what it means is you, you have, uh, you're certified to be interoperable. So you could grab vendor A, you could grab vendor B, they're going to 
talk to each other and have no issues. That's not to say somebody that doesn't have certification isn't going to work with any other product. There's just less assurances that that's the case. So another thing to consider is roaming. And this is really where I think the industrial technologies uh, really show. Um, standard roaming for commercial grade stuff is usually about three to five seconds. Uh, and you can't uh, tweak thresholds and things like that. So if your signal gets too weak, it's going to usually latch on until, uh, until the last breath, essentially, until the signal completely dies, and then it, it, it actually does roam. Now, if you think about it, in office space, you don't, normally don't need fast roaming. Uh, if, you're go if you're moving around your office, you're going from one... Uh, cubicle to maybe a conference room or whatnot, um, you, A, you're not going to be walking around with your laptop on, uh, probably not safe, right? Um, or, or on, or, or more accurately, you're looking at the, at the screen while you're doing something with it. Uh, you, you know, you close it, you move to the conference room, turn it back on, or, or take it out of standby, and then do your thing. Uh, and, and if it takes a couple seconds to get to latch on, not a big deal. But in many roaming applications in a more hardened environment, story, roaming is very important. So it's very important that you go from one access point to another access point in the shortest time possible. So where three to five seconds is, is what you see in the commercial space. In the industrial space, you can be seen uh, in the millisecond range, like 0.15 seconds to even 0 0.05 seconds with a controller-based solution. So much faster roaming times. Other things you've got, you got to realize is how mission critical is this? If it's mission critical, then you're going to be using uh, redundancy. That's an important technology. Where in the commercial space, again, often you're going to be using technologies like STP, which I, I, I recommend you guys avoid if you, if you can, uh, step, uh, step span tree protocol. Or rapid span tree, much preferable, uh, versus STP. With, with the STP, uh, and there's not too many technologies out there that use it, but uh, if you do see it, um, it takes about 30 seconds. And your entire network's affected with SDP. Rapid span entry uh, recoveries are, are less than five seconds. So much better. And many times the entire network isn't affected. But there are times with rapid span entry where you have a break uh, on the system and it'll affect the entire network. When I mean the entire network, I'm not just talking about the Wi Fi infrastructure, I'm also talking about your, your switch infrastructure. Because if you're using rapid span entry through your entire system and it's all layer two system, um, uh, it could go through what's known in networking as a state of convergence. And one of the first steps of rapid span tree when it does a convergence cycle is it goes into a state of blocking and uh, blocking slash learning, which essentially means it's not talking to anyone. It's just going to sit there and it's going to listen and um, blocking slash listening, sorry. So that's not good. Um, now, in the industrial space, though, you're going to see other technologies, like this is one of ours called Aerolink, that... Uh, gives you recovery times of 0.3 seconds as opposed to 3 to 5 seconds. Um, and it's independent of the rest of the network infrastructure. It's not going to affect your switches or anything like that in the network. So it gives you the same type of redundancy as well as having really fast failover times. So number five mistake is focusing on the initial cost only. So when you think of price, there's a lot of different types of price. And price could be really alluring. Uh, now, you, you guys responded to that really well, so you don't all look at, at initial buying costs, and that's, that's really, really assuring to me. But, but don't look just at the price. You know, there's a lot, of, uh, there's a lot to price, really, right? Uh, and if you think of price, think of it in, in this way, your total cost, I say. This is called the total cost of ownership. There are several elements to it, from purchase price, installation cost, configuration cost, operating cost. Uh, maintenance cost, downtime, and, and uh, support. One quick way to remember this is Pico MD, like small doctors. Um, so let's talk about the upfront cost, the purchase price, installation, and configuration. So purchase price, that's pretty self-explanatory, I think. You know, how much you pay for the unit, right? What, what did it cost you? Installation, what is it, how much did it cost you to install? Now this is applicable also to determining whether you're going to be using wireless or wired. Um, how mission critical is the network? How, how much is it going to cost me to do a wired network? How much is it going to cost me to do a wireless network? These will help you, uh, I think, uh, determine which network is best for you. So installation cost is going to be a factor as well as configuration. Um, and, and when you think of, of uh, the cost, think of the labor, the trenching. Uh, 
and all, all the downtime that may get required too. There might be some downtime, especially if you're replacing an old system and you have to shut down everything to replace it. There's going to be downtime. Uh, new system may not be applicable, of course. And the, when you think of operating cost, think of two things really. Uh, a, how much power is the unit uh, taking? If that's important. And, and second, um, does it have any cooling or heating needs? But that's also going to incur more power, right? Um, if it needs to be in an air conditioned space, then you need to make sure if it's a, it has AC, AC ventilation and whatnot. So the third cost is more times of trouble when, when things go bad, right? Uh, or, or preventing things from going bad in terms of maintenance. Uh, now maintenance is like upkeep. Making sure if it has fans, you want to make sure the fans are, are being cleaned. Um, if it has vents, the same thing. You want to make sure that those are clean. Uh, those fans may have to be replaced X amount of time, so you want to make sure you're doing that in, in that duration and whatnot. Um, a lot of industrial grade stuff, though, you find that uh, often they don't use fans. They may have vent holes, and some are completely sealed. Uh, so it depends on, on the given manufacturer. But, but that's one core difference. And often the unit needs replacement, right? There's different levels of MTBFs, um, mean times between failures for different uh, type of players. A commercial, is, it, the expectation is you can be replacing that a little bit more frequent than industrial players that are going to almost leave it and forget it type of, of scenario. Downtime is actually a very important one that uh, I think uh, many overlook. It's what happens when, when this device does fail? How long does it take to, to uh, recover? Uh, if the device fails or communication fails, like uh, in wireless you may have interference, um, that's why you have to have that redundancy. So this helps you determine whether you need that redundancy. You know, what's your, your downtime cost is very low. It may, maybe it doesn't make sense having that wireless redundancy. But if your downtime cost is high, then having that redundancy might, might be a given. Um, and, and even having multi-levels of redundancy, having three connections as opposed to just two. Uh, if, if your downtime is that expensive, you want to make sure you have a quick, uh, cheap insurance against that. Another thing you want to look at is, is your support cost. Um, this is a big difference in play, I think, versus a commercial and industrial. Uh, commercial, usually you, you have service contracts, you have to uh, purchase um, you have to purchase these contracts in order to talk to people on the phone for, for support, uh, as well as getting firmware upgrades sometimes. Those are things you want to look at. In the in industrial space, you can see this is normally uh, not what most uh, players in the space do. Uh, usually, you're going to get full, uh, free tech support. Um, for us, you get it for the life of the product. Uh, you also get free firmware upgrades on a regular basis. So that's something that's to be expected in the space. So with that, poll question number four. Which of these mistakes relate to you the most? Alrighty, so we have like underestimating how different wireless communication is, neglecting to collect site data, that's doing the site planning and whatnot, assuming more is better, adapting equipment beyond intended purpose, or focusing on initial cost only. So while you guys are uh, voting in this poll, just letting you know that we're getting close to wrapping up the presentation part of this uh, webinar, and we'll move into the live Q&A. Uh, even if you don't have questions, we do appreciate uh, if you do uh, stay on the line uh, and, and, and participate, or at least listen. Um, and if you do in, uh, don't not participate in the Q&A, uh, participate in the poll or the survey that we have after the webinar so we know uh, whether or not this content is useful, how we can improve it. So we'll go ahead and take a look at the results of this final poll, and then we'll go ahead and wrap it up, wrap up the presentation part of uh, the webinar. And let's take a look at how it turned out. Great, thank you everyone again for filling this out. So focusing on initial costs seemed to be a, a something that was applicable to a lot of you. Uh, that's great, uh, great information, should I say. Um, it's never great to, to do a fallacy, of course. Um, 
But, and we have a tie, right, for number two, neglecting to collect site data and adapting the equipment beyond its intended purpose. So these are two different things that are, are applicable to you guys. So with that, let's close up with some tips, right? We, we told you guys what not to do. Let's tell you what to do better than what not to do, right? So first I'll say know when to deploy wireless. Second, do a site survey. So th that's what we were talking about earlier, planning this out, doing a site survey. Are you going to do this for every installation? Uh, that question, that answer, is, it depends really. Or, or I'll, say, I'll say no. Uh, smaller deployments, there are tools available in the products that help you do some of this stuff early on, like scanning for channels and things like that. But if you want a true successful deployment, uh, something that's mission critical or, or a large deployment, you really want to take the time to, to do it right and, and to make sure you you have a, you invest the time to, to make sure you, have, you find interference and you find out where your signals are going to go, reach, not reach, and things like that. Okay, figure for the appropriate signal strength, right? Too strong could be bad. We, we talked about that. Um, you don't want it to be too strong. As well as, obviously, you don't want it to be too weak either, of course. Uh, choose the right equipment for the given environment. So whatever the environment is, you want to choose the right equipment for it. If it's a hardened environment, you can use a hardened product. If it's a uh, commercial space, it's something that's air conditioned, and it's more office space, you're not going to put an industrial grade product there. It doesn't make sense. And when you look at, at uh, deploying something, look at just beyond the initial purchase cost. There's a lot of elements to, to, your, to your cost, and you don't want to be surprised uh, later on. So with that, I want to thank everyone for making it. And I want to ask you guys, who has the first question? All right, so it's time for our live Q&A. So if you have any questions, remember to go ahead and use that questions pane uh, to submit your questions. Um, and we do appreciate, uh, after the webinar, uh, if you complete our feedback survey. Uh, so, Nick, we do already have a couple of questions. First question should be a simple one. What does RSSI stand for? That's a good question. And honestly, it slipped my mind. Um, but I'll get back to you guys on that one. All right. So here's another question. Are there features available on commercial Wi-Fi products that aren't found in industrial? Features found in commercial grade that's not found in industrial? Uh, I'll say certainly. Remember, they're built for different environments. Um, IT, IT staff usually, they're okay doing a little bit more configuration uh, to be able to get uh, the most out of the product. So there's going to be more, more setting changes that you're not going to see in, in uh, industrial. Like, for example, um, I didn't mention MSTP, uh, multiple span tree protocol. That, that's a protocol that's often uh, in the commercial space. Uh, I haven't seen it in the industrial space. So that might be a protocol that uh, they might be using, for example. Uh, that, that is similar to a rapid span tree, except that it supports VLANs. Um, Doing uh, guest networks, for example, that's something that's very important in the commercial space. But in industrial space, you're not gonna, you don't want uh, guest guest systems in any way uh, around your your important uh, mission critical stuff. So you're not gonna see that, even though it it is possible, but it, it takes a little bit more work to do it with industrial. Great, thank you very much, Nick. Uh, we had a couple of questions about wireless uh, standards, uh, so I'll see if I can summarize them in one question. Uh, can you quickly go over the A, B, G, N, and A, C wireless standards um, in, a, in a minute or two and recommendations on when to use which one? That's kind of a big question. Well, let's see what you do with that. That's actually a, a very great question. Um, so just a little bit of history. Uh, it looks, and I hope I don't get any of this wrong. I may get, I may get the order of study off. But 802.11b... I'm trying to remember whether it was B or A. No, it was A. I think they came out first. So 802.11 A and B, I know they came around around the same time. Um, 802.11 B is a 54 meg per, uh, sorry, 54 meg? I'm just checking my, my math here. No, it's 11 megs. Uh, it was G when we got to 54. It was 11 megs per second uh, throughput. So it's very slow. Uh, but it worked in 2.4, so unlike 
uh, 8011A was 54 megs per second. Uh, it worked in the 5 gigahertz space. So what we learned about frequencies, one thing is that uh, 2.4 has more more distance. Uh, A, A had very little uh, frequency ability. Uh, A, because of the given frequency and also how they did the, the multiplexing, they only recommended about 15 meters as a standard. And that said, you could go much farther than that with A, but with the right antennas and whatnot. But it was built to handle only about 15 meters. Um, where 802.11b was able to handle 100 meters. Uh, so, so B and A are, are both older technologies. Uh, then you got, you got G, which is a much newer variant of B. So G only works on the 2.4 space. Uh, and, and that's the one where really, when it came out, uh, B, B did a lot to make uh, Wi-Fi uh, prolific. Uh, when G came out, it really cemented it, especially in industrial space, because now you had 54 megs per second. You had the same distance capabilities as the to 11 b essentially, for the most part. Um, and, and again, much more bandwidth. So it was, it was great uh, then, but then they, they we're able to develop N as well as AC. So N is something you see in industrial space, AC not so. AC you do see in the commercial space. In industrial space, uh, things take longer to get to industrial space. It has to be fully uh, uh, vetted and tested before it even gets to industrial space. So AC, we're not gonna see that until probably next year until it starts getting bigger in there. Uh, with and uh, one thing that's interesting about that technology is that now you could work in 2.4 and 5. Now, one thing that I should mention is, as a standard, you're allowed to work in 2.4 or 5, but you're not you're not um, required to. So, so that when I was saying earlier, there are some low-cost vendors that only work on 2.4. So keep that in mind. So just because you're using N doesn't mean you're going to be able to support both frequencies. So that's one thing you have to look at. Um, N introduces a technology called MIMO, multiple in, multiple out to get much higher data rates. Uh, with N, you could get you could go from 300 to all the way up to about 600 megs per second, which is a big jump from 54. Um, one of the advantages of MIMO, uh, like I was at a steel plant, I remember a few years ago, just when N came out, and they were using GE, it wasn't working very well for them, so I, I told them, you know, use N instead, and it's gonna work a lot better, and it did, uh, because with with G, you were getting a lot of reflections, and reflections could cancel themselves out, uh, cancel out your signal, which is not good. With N, though, it actually takes advantage of these reflections, and you can actually use these different reflections as a different data path. So the more reflections many times could actually, with N, and as well as AC, be better for the system. So that's where, where these two technologies come out. Uh, AC is a higher bandwidth. Uh, it, I'm trying to remember the exact numbers. Uh, uh, I believe it goes big, but uh, I won't speak to it because I don't want to misspeak. Um, but AC is one of the newest standards. Uh, it's mainly uh, in the commercial space today. It's not so much in the industrial space. Thanks very much, Nick. Uh, I had a feeling that that was a question that was going to require a lot of text. So uh, just so for everyone on the call, be, uh, be aware that uh, we will be sending the recording of this presentation, plus slides, plus written answers to every question that uh, has been submitted, uh, even if we aren't able to get to it to the live session. So don't be afraid to submit the question, and don't be disappointed if we don't get to it to the live session. Uh, we are keeping track of it, and we will uh, issue written follow-ups um, after the after this webinar. Uh, so quickly, uh, n next question, uh, more specifically to an application, what is your recommendation, Nick, for uh, frequencies uh, if you're uh, working with an industrial pump station that may have very low levels and thick walls and slabs? Well, thick walls, uh, well, it, it would depend. Um, it sounds like if the walls are really thick, 2.4 may not uh, propagate through it. So I would use 900 megahertz. Now keep in mind, you could use some of these technologies in conjunction. Like for example, you could use the 900 megahertz radios to sort of provide as a wireless backbone. And uh, connected to, the, to the, each one of these sides would be a standard uh, wireless access points that could provide 2.4 or, or 5 gigahertz to the devices connected to it. Uh, so keep in mind that that option is available to you. Um, but if, if the walls are really thick uh, uh, and you want to use standard uh, Wi-Fi, I would use 2.4. If 2.4 did not work out for you, I will use 900 megahertz. Um, and you may have to do it, as, as I said, in conjunction with an, 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 a different radio. So you're, you're running two radios in that case. 
Thank you very much, Nick. Um, here's another question. Even though the Wi-Fi channels are completely clear, I'm still having trouble achieving a reliable connection and good bandwidth. What should I be looking at? That's a good question. Um, so for, first, I will say making sure that's truly clear. So one, one thing that I, I often do recommend, when you, especially when you see signals uh, degrading, it's, it's really hard to isolate. Um, what's going on with the signal, doing spectrum analysis, and there's tools out there, and, and they're, compared to, to, to other tools, they're, they're not as expensive. Um, not to say that they're very cheap either, uh, but they're, they're definitely a lot more, uh, less costly than some of these other uh, tools. But the, these tools allow you to actually look at, at, at what's really there. Uh, the hardware in your computer or on the devices don't have the ability to, to do that, to do a full spectrum analysis. You have to buy special hardware to do that. And it's usually, there's just these devices you can put as a USB dongle, it goes into your computer, and then you have the ability to do spectrum analysis. That's one thing I'll do. But uh, if you don't want to invest in the tools, uh, another approach is just, uh, just trial and error, changing different channels until, uh, looking at the noise floor is important. Uh, you'll see that in our devices, it'll tell you what the noise floor is, and most would too. Um, you want to make sure that the noise, you're choosing a noise floor that, that is uh, really low, but that's not 100% accurate because it's not going to it doesn't have spectrum analyzer in, in it. Um, but if you see that uh, you have issues with one channel, I'll, I'll just jump to a different channel. Um, or, even better yet, if you have that option, jump to a different frequency. So if you're, see, you're seeing a lot of issues in 2.4, might be too congested, jumping to 5 gigahertz might be the better option. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, some of these questions are definitely beyond my technical understanding, so I'll read them as, uh, as accurately as I can. Um, Nick, do our industrial APs have the ability to tie to a controller for LDAP with AD? And please don't ask me what that stands for. Uh, I'll have to do my own Google search for that. But uh, Nick, if you're able to speak to that. That's a good question. So, so one thing that's a that's a little different from uh, industrial versus commercial. In commercial, you often have these controllers, and, and you have uh, what's known as LWAPs, lightweight lightweight access uh, uh, points. That an LWAP essentially is a device that's that's very um, doesn't have any intelligence to it, and, and all the intelligence is on the controller side. Um, in industrial space, you don't see that too often. I, I've yet to really see it. Uh, the main reason being is because um, the mission criticality nature of, of uh, industrial industrial designs, you, that controller, that's, it becomes a central point of failure. Uh, and yes, uh, there are ways to build uh, redundancy, having two controllers and, and some vendors out there. Uh, most, I don't think, have that option. Uh, but there's, there's a big um, transi transition time going from one controller to another controller. Uh, so in industrial, you're going to find that most do, don't have controllers. Now, I did mention, uh, if you guys were paying attention, uh, when I was talking about roaming about a controller, but our controller is a little different. It's designed specifically for fast roaming. It's to give you a 0 0.05 millisecond fast roaming, but it's not designed for configuration and whatnot. So alternatives to that is using software, network management software, to, to be able to configure uh, as well as monitor your system. Um, for example, we, we actually have a software suite that could do mass deployment to, to our autonomous access points. Uh, it's called autonomous because each one is independent of each other, so if one fails, it doesn't affect anything on the system. There's no central point of failure. It's more distributed. All right. Thank you very much, Nick, for that answer. I hope that answered that question question. I hope I read that accurately. Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two, depending on the answer here, Nick. Uh, Nick, do you have any recommendations for tools that people can use for site survey or to analyze the site? Tools for site surveys. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. Um, so it definitely depends in the uh, how often you could be doing this and how big, how important the site deployment is to choosing which are the right tools. But I could definitely give you guys recommendations. Like one quick and easy cheap one will be simply using the, the wireless calculator I gave you. That's iwcalculator.moxa.com. Um, That's a free one, but it's not going to give you the level uh, the other tools do. 
Uh, for spectrum analysis, you really have you have several options, but the two big ones uh, would be uh, Air Magnet it has a whole suite, but they're over ten grand uh, to get the entire suite with spectrum analyzer and and, and everything um, and heat map and so on. Uh, there's another tool, and I'm trying to remember. Uh, uh, Air, uh, MetaGeek, there you go. MetaGeek makes another t a tool that's uh, it's much cheaper. The, 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 the dongle itself is like four, five hundred dollars, um, and the software, if you cho chose to use their software, is like another five hundred dollars, is about a grand, which is significantly lower than uh, the other option. Um, now, now for doing full heat maps and things like that, uh, Air Magnet is, is again one of the, the options, uh, which is that ten grand tool. Uh, another one is Ecohow. Uh, Ecohow is actually um, widely used as well. Uh, internationally, maybe a little bit more market share in, in uh, heat mapping software, but that one's still not not super cheap. It, it's half the price of Air Magnet, about. Um, which is good, but still, it's going to be about five grand and whatnot to buy something like that. Uh, I don't know of any free solutions out there, so if you guys do discover a good one, you know, let, uh, let me know. All right, thanks very much for that question, and uh, thanks for that answer, Nick. Uh, I think that uh, is all we have the time for. There are still a, a, quite a few really good questions out there, but don't worry. Um, uh, we've recorded those questions, and we will be sending that follow-up to, to everyone on the call and everyone who's actually registered. Uh, so with that, uh, I think we'll go ahead and close the, the webinar. Everyone, thanks for the great questions. Hope you all enjoyed our presentation. And thanks again for tuning in, and have a great rest of the week. Thank you, everyone.